If you watch famous dramas like Sanditon, Hamilton, and Bridgerton showing the 18th century aristocratic era, you will see diversity in their cast. That's because, at that time, England and France did have black aristocrats and celebrities who are shown in the dramas. However, many people think that it's incorrect and that the black cast was added to misguide the audience. But interestingly, they are wrong. And these dramas really show the reality of the past of England, France, and the black people's position there. Welcome to a new episode of Black Culture Diary, a channel where we talk about less known and hidden black history, culture, arts, and lost civilization. We scrutinize history here to bring the black culture back on the surface again. We encourage you to join our community in supporting and building a strong black history education medium. This episode is going to change how you think about 18th century England and France and black people at that time. Let's get started. Whenever we think about England, France, and other colonial European powers of the 17th and 18th centuries, we remember black people in only one way, slaves. Perhaps this is partly true because at that time, despite black Africans being used as slaves, black people could reach the upper end of society. Yes, black people did reach Europe as slaves, but with their talent, capabilities, and skills, earned higher positions unknown to many. Let's start with Louise Marie Therese, whose story began when she was brought to the Abbey of Moray as a young child in 1665. But throughout her life, the details of her birth remained a mystery, sparking speculation among the residents of the illustrious Palace of Versailles. It's because rumors circulated suggesting that the enigmatic black nun of Moray might be the secret child of Queen Maria Theresa and King Louis XIV of France. At the court of Versailles, it was well known that King Louis XIV had a fondness for his mistresses, often overshadowing his commitment to his wife. There were instances when he would visit the queen's bedchamber only after she had given birth to an heir. In 1664, Queen Maria Theresa tragically lost a baby girl who appeared slightly dark in complexion, a condition sometimes observed in infants deprived of oxygen in the womb. However, rumors quickly spread that the princess had not died, but had been secretly hidden because of her darker skin tone. Some less familiar with scientific explanations even attributed the alleged concealment to the queen's love for hot chocolate, suggesting it had somehow influenced the baby's skin color. Speculations arose that the queen might have had an affair with her African servant, Nabu, who happened to be a dwarf. While it was more socially acceptable for a king to engage in adultery, the idea of a queen being involved in such a scandal was deemed unimaginable. There were even allegations that Nabu had been banished from the palace or perhaps imprisoned, leading some to identify him as the mysterious man in the Iron Mask. Interestingly, despite these speculations, Nabu continued to serve at the court even after the queen died in 1683. After Maria Theresa's passing, the rumors about her lost child resurfaced. Numerous courtiers visited the mysterious black nun of Moray in the hopes of finding any resemblance or connection that could unravel the mystery. However, it eventually came to light that Louise had been delivered to the Murray Monastery by a trusted royal advisor shortly after the Queen's tragic delivery in 1664. Historical research suggests that Louise was more likely the illegitimate daughter of King Louis XIV with an unknown woman of African descent. Several compelling clues support this theory since Louise carried the name of the king himself, which would be unlikely if she were truly the daughter of her mother's lover. No matter what the case, she received a generous allowance from the king's treasury, indicating a paternal connection. Court artist Pierre Kuber even painted a portrait of her titled The Religious Black Princess, which was included among other missing documents in a collection known as The Moorish Daughter of Louis XVI. Furthermore, courtiers who encountered Louise, including the esteemed Voltaire, noted her striking resemblance to the king rather than the queen. Louise herself fervently believed in her royal lineage, evident in her interactions with the Dauphin, the heir to the throne. When he came to meet her, she warmly greeted him as my brother, emphasizing her conviction. Notably, Madame de Montanon, King Louis XIV's secret second wife, frequently visited Louise and even attended her holy vows ceremony. Throughout her life, Louise lived as a French aristocrat, passing away at the age of 68. Before we continue further, tell us, are you enjoying the video? If yes, Please like and share the video and subscribe to our channel to watch more videos on black culture, history, 
civilization, and identity. Let's continue now. Another important personality emerged in 18th century England, Ignatius Sancho. Born on a slave ship during the perilous Atlantic crossing, Ignatius faced early tragedy as his mother tragically passed away shortly after they arrived in the Spanish colony of New Granada. Heartbreakingly, his father chose to end his own life rather than endure a life of enslavement. At the tender age of two, Ignatius was taken to Greenwich, England by his owner and subsequently became the ward of three unmarried sisters who treated him as an exotic pet, giving him the name Sancho, inspired by a character in Miguel de Cervantes' famous novel Don Quixote. Ignatius faithfully served the sisters until he turned 20. During this transformative period, Ignatius caught the attention of John Duke of Montague, a frequent visitor to the sisters. Recognizing Ignatius's intellect, honesty, and friendliness, the Duke took on the role of his mentor, introducing him to the world of knowledge and culture. Under the Duke's guidance, Ignatius learned to read and write, gaining access to books from the Duke's personal library and broadening his intellectual horizons. Education became a catalyst, awakening Ignatius's awareness of the profound injustice of slavery. Driven by a sense of moral duty, he made the bold decision to escape his servitude at the age of 20 and sought refuge at Montague House. Within the sanctuary of Montague House, Ignatius assumed the role of a butler, serving Lady Montague while immersing himself in the realms of music, poetry, literature, and writing. His talents blossomed, and he composed music, wrote plays, and even published a book on music theory. Notably, a renowned artist named Alan Ramsey painted a portrait of Ignatius during this transformative period, proudly capturing his African heritage. After Lady Montague's death, Ignatius's life took an unexpected turn as he inherited a significant sum of money. In 1758, he married Anne Osborne, a woman from the West Indies, and together they had seven children. Ignatius continued to serve the Montague family, this time under George Montague, Lady Montague's son-in-law and designated heir. His impressive accomplishments and refined demeanor earned him recognition in high society, where he fearlessly advocated for the abolition of slavery. Ignatius's outspoken views on ending slavery gained widespread attention, particularly through his correspondence with renowned novelist Lawrence Stern. Their discussions on the subject propelled Ignatius into the spotlight, and his contributions became a significant force in the 18th century anti-slavery movement. Significantly, Ignatius's dedication to the cause translated into tangible actions. He established a residence and grocery store in Mayfair, London, where he traded goods such as tobacco, sugar, and tea products deeply connected to the labor of enslaved individuals in the West Indies. As a landowner, Ignatius gained the right to vote at Westminster, becoming the first recorded person of African descent to cast a ballot in a British general election. His charisma and warmth fostered friendships with esteemed intellectuals, artists, and influential politicians of the era, including James Fox, who played a crucial role in passing a bill that ultimately outlawed the abhorrent slave trade for British subjects in 1806. Tragically, Ignatius's life was cut short by gout at the age of 50, making him the first person of African descent to have an obituary published in British newspapers, a testament to his profound impact on society. The third figure we will discuss is Joseph Bologna, known as Chevalier de Saint-Georges. He was born in 1745 on the Caribbean island of Guadeloupe to a French plantation owner and Nanon, a young enslaved maid of Senegalese origin. When Joseph was seven years old, his father took him to France. It's worth mentioning that in 1315, King Louis the X declared that any enslaved person who set foot on French soil would be considered free. In France, Joseph enjoyed his newfound freedom and had the opportunity to attend boarding school. Even at a young age, his talents and skills were evident. At the age of 13, he joined a fencing school where he displayed exceptional talent and defeated more experienced fighters. The fencing sport is a type of sword fighting, but more sophisticated than ordinary one. This caught the attention of many, leading to a highly publicized duel against a renowned fencing master. Supporters of slavery bet against Joseph, while abolitionists supported him. Joseph emerged victorious, gaining fame and recognition. Eventually, he became a personal bodyguard to King Louis XV, earning the title of Chevalier, the French equivalent of a knight. When his father passed away, Joseph and his mother were left well provided for. Joseph's fame extended beyond his skills in fencing. 
He was also a gifted violinist and composer who delighted audiences with his solos and compositions. He created numerous string quartets, sonatas, symphonies, plays, and ballets. Notably, even Beethoven held him in high regard. Joseph's musical talents captivated Queen Marie Antoinette, who often attended his performances incognito. He became a true celebrity of the 18th century, adored by young sportsmen, musicians, and fashionable society. Joseph's charm and popularity made him a sought-after guest at balls and salons where he formed close connections with many women. It should be noted that Joseph embraced the ideals of the French Revolution and became a strong advocate for equal rights. He traveled to London, performing fencing exhibitions for King George III and the Prince of Wales, garnering support for the abolitionist cause. Returning to France, Joseph enlisted in the Revolutionary Army and eventually became a colonel of the Legion Saint-Georges, the first all-black regiment in Europe. However, he became entangled in conflicts among revolutionary leaders, resulting in his removal from command and imprisonment for 18 months. Despite his loyal followers calling for his release, Joseph was not allowed to rejoin the army. Disillusioned with politics, Joseph traveled to the Caribbean island of Saint-Domingue to support enslaved individuals in their struggle during the Haitian Revolution. After spending two years there, he returned to Paris. Sadly, Joseph passed away at the age of 53 in 1799 due to gangrene. Without witnessing the complete abolition of slavery in French colonies, which occurred in 1848, did you know that black aristocrats and celebrities existed in 18th century England and France? What do you think? Why are we only told about black slaves, but not wealthy black personalities? Let us know in the comments section below what you think about these rather unknown black celebrities and aristocrats of colonial England and France. Also, would you like to watch the second part of this video? Do you want to watch more videos like this one? If yes, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon next to it. We have decided to bring videos on something nobody talks about, the black culture, civilization, history, and evidence about how glorious blacks have. Ben, thanks for watching, and until the next video, stay tuned.